Jeff Rosenfeld with the American Meteorological Society, and I'm here with a book and an author. This is Bob Henson and his new book, The Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. And Bob uh, wrote this book for the American Meteorological Society, and AMS now has it available in its online store. Uh, Bob, first of all, this sort of has a, a rough history behind it, so maybe you can explain how it came about. It does. I thank you for mentioning that. We like to say we've smoothed it out now, but it uh, began in 2006 with a book for a company called Rough Guys. It is now part of the Penguin uh, Publishing Company, a very large company. But it started out as a, a small travel publisher in the 1980s, and it was called Rough Guide because that's a common phrase in England to denote something like a, a quick take on something. So Rough Guide was a phrase before the company came along. Uh, they made their name with travel books that were very smart very comprehensive and very readable all at the same time. And in the 90s, with their success, they branched out into other fields. So in 2002, I did the Rough Guide to Weather, which was their first science book. And then they decided they would like a climate change book. And with some trepidation at first, I went into it. And uh, that book came out, the Rough Guide to Climate Change, came out in 2006. We updated it in 2008. Uh, did a third edition in 2011. And now I brought it over to AMS. And it is now the Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. So very happy to now be in the AMS staple. Yeah, and we're happy you're in the staple too. Of course, you also have written a book on television weather casting, uh, and that is also in the AMS staple. So uh, congratulations on both of those. With this book, you've entered a difficult territory because there are a lot of people writing about climate change. So maybe you could explain a little bit about how your approach is a little different. Well, there are a lot of books on climate change out there. There weren't so many when I did the first version of this in 2006. Uh, what it, the book still is now, and I tried to make it even more comprehensive, this version than it ever has been, is really an all about climate change guide. Uh, there are a lot of people who know something about climate change. You can read a few articles or whatever, but you really want something that's a one-stop shop that you can hold in your hands and look up. Uh, what's this I hear about satellites not warming satellite drive temperatures not warming as much as surface temperatures. Uh, what's this about global dimming? Uh, what, you know, what kind of debates have been going on? What's been happening in other countries in terms of climate change and political approaches to solving it? So uh, it's, there's a little bit of everything in the book. I try to include enough so people understand the issues, uh, that not more information than you necessarily want or need. So uh, hopefully we, we hit that sweet spot. Yeah, being smart, comprehensive, and readable all at the same time is very difficult. <laughs> but you've done that. Uh, one of the things that you did uh, in becoming comprehensive, it seems that you've covered a lot of uh, issues that are not strictly speaking the science, but about how people receive the science. Sidebars in the book about uh, people's attitudes towards even the history of the Earth as a whole. And then also a whole section on what to do as yes. a person. Yeah, that was, and that's something people have asked about a lot, is, is you know, what, what do I do? It can be, feel like a very daunting problem. And I don't think any one action we take is going to, to solve climate change, but uh, if you approach it in a down-to-earth, uh, practical manner, there are a lot of things we can do that will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Uh, something as unsexy as insulating your house can make a huge difference. Um, you know, somewhere between a third and a half of all the emissions of this country are due to heating and cooling buildings. People often think of transportation and burning coal as the main factors of climate change. But, you know, simply you know, insulating your house, um, uh, changes in your diet can affect greenhouse gases quite a bit. So there's a lot of things you can do on a very practical level that do make a difference. At the same time, we have to think about adjusting to the climate change that's already kind of cooked in and baked into the system, because there is a lot of that, and that's not going to change. Um, so I try to look at both sides of that. and also. I don't want people to come away feeling too pessimistic. I mean, I, I call myself a concerned optimist. Um, you know, the Earth's not going to, to give out on us. We're, we're going to have a world, but the world is changing, and we need to adapt to it and uh, try to keep things from changing any more than, than we are looking to. So if I read this book cover to cover, which I, I did look at the earlier version, you know, I had a copy for many years, and it, it's been very helpful to me. Um, I'm trying to think. Is the thinking person going to be sleeping better at night after they read the book or before they read the book? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully better after. And, you know, knowledge is always good. Even if some knowledge can be disconcerting. You know, it's better to, to know your enemy, and it's better to know your friends. I mean, in all cases, you know, you, you've got to know what's happening. 
Uh, there are unsettling things about this topic. I mean, I, I've been distressed at times having to cover uh, you know, the, the difficulty of public understanding of the consensus, you know, the fact that uh, less than half the public think scientists agree on the basics of climate change, when in fact nearly all scientists agree on the basics you know, the carbon dioxide put out by humans is forming the planet. So, uh, you know, those, those are tough issues, but I think they're unavoidable, and so uh, instead of fretting about them or just trying to ignore them, why not understand them, do what we can do, and then, uh, you know, not spend our time worrying, but spend our time doing and, and not fretting. I, I don't know. It's just my philosophy. I think of you as somebody who tends to, to act uh, on this principle. I mean, you, you, the kind of life that you live has been, in general, for as long as I've known you, you know, pretty ecologically friendly. And, and uh, you've been a model to a lot of people in that regard, uh, just personally. So I'm just kind of wondering where that came from and whether that has fueled any of your interest in climate as a subject. Well, I, you know, as we all have, I've had life challenges, and, and some of my approach to that has been to focus on things I can change and to, to let go and not worry about things I can't change. And when it comes to climate change, no one of us can fix it, so I really try to adopt that approach to the climate change problem. I, you know, I bicycle a lot, and, and I live in a beautiful part of the country where you can't bicycle a lot, but I also drive a year around. So I purchased a car, I had the same car for 15 years, and it was time to get another one last year. And so I thought, well, I'm always talking and writing about climate change. I really should get a really efficient car. But um, a study came out by Climate Central last year on climate-friendly cars and got me thinking about the various options, because there's hybrids, there's plug-ins, there's all-electric cars. And it ended up settling for, well, not settling, I really like it. Uh, it's a Ford Z-Max Energy model, not many people know about, that is a plug-in and a hybrid. So it will go about 20 to 25 miles on pure electricity and then gas after that. So depending on the length of your commute, you can calibrate the car you buy so that most of your commute is electric. And then you still have the gas engine to go further distances. And I think we're going to see more and more of these cars in the next few years. And now, basically, when I'm in town, 90% of my driving is electric. My electricity comes from a solar allocation through my local utility. So in a sense, uh, that amount of driving is carbon neutral. Now, those electrons are not necessarily coming from, <laughs> sorry, I, I said solar, I meant wind power. So, okay. yeah, those electrons are not necessarily coming from the windmills because it's all kind of mixed together. But your utility will let you pay a small fee and then certify that what, you, know, you, you are getting an amount of electricity equal to the amount they're adding to the system as the wind power. So I've tried to do things like that and, you know, um, I think everybody could figure out what in their lives that everybody's going to go buy a car. You know, all of us can buy a car in any given year. Um, as I said, insulating your house is an inexpensive thing a lot of people do. Yeah. Now, there are perverse incentives, and I talk about this in the book. Um, there are millions of residences that are rented, right? So is it in the interest of the landlord to spend the money to lower the utility bills when it's the person renting who pays the utility bills, right? Yeah. The person renting may not want to install you know, weather stripping or whatever when they may be moving out in a year. So I think that it's up to society and lawmakers to come up with policies that further saving carbon, uh, and that doesn't have to be a political thing, you know, it's conserving energy is in everybody's interest. I like to say that I'm a conservative, I believe in conserving energy, because you know, it's an amazing, fossil fuels are an amazing resource, and we may want to have some around in a hundred or two or three hundred years, so let's use what we have wisely and uh, find the alternatives to the same thing. Now, um, given this, the, all these options and different ways of dealing with, with climate change on an individual basis, uh, when you uh, meet a thinking person mm -hmm. and you say, hi, I wrote a book on this subject, what's the first question they're, they're likely to ask? What's the thing that seems to be on people's minds and how do you address it? Well, I still get often the question that has been asked for years and years. Is it, is it real or is it man-made or uh, what part might be natural? The natural variability thing in people's minds is often translated as there may be a natural explanation for all the climate change we're getting, for the entire global temperature increase. Um, there really isn't any natural explanation that has been accepted as a working hypothesis. There simply isn't. I mean, the, the energy from the sun has not increased appreciably in the last 50 years. Um, there are plenty of natural cycles all over the place that influence global temperature, but those don't explain what's happened in terms of long-term warming over the last 100 years, especially the last uh, 40 years. And what if somebody comes at you and says, that, that drought 
they're having or, or Hurricane Sandy, that couldn't possibly be global warming. Well, that's a legitimate question, and it's, it's still not easy to do the science to connect and whether that's climate change. There's more of that work being done. There are in, uh, literal attribution studies where they will calculate using modeling the odds of a certain weather event what, that that may have happened or become more likely to happen because of climate change. A heat wave in Europe in 2003, which killed upwards of 50, 60,000 people, a horrible tragedy. They've estimated that that uh, became several times more likely because of the amount of uh, global warming in the atmosphere. So, you know, I think um, that work is important. I think we all also, at the same time, have to remember that every event has multiple causes. Uh, there's no single cause for anything, I think, in our world, pretty much. Uh, any, at least nothing like climate change. So. Every weather event is going to have some natural variability component and, and some climate change component. Uh, many times the climate change component will be so small that it can't really be measured. Other times, for example, with Hurricane Sandy, we know that the sea level on the coast of, of uh, the New York area has risen almost a foot in the last century, right? <laughs> most of that, you know, some of it due to sustenance, but mostly due to warming oceans and changes in ocean circulation related to that. So you could legitimately say that that top foot or so of flooding in Sandy was climate change. It's one of the rare cases where you can point to something tangible and say, yeah, there's climate change. Now this, this sort of brings in so many different topics, so many causes, as you're saying, everything has multiple causes, and uh, everything is changing. It's not, the world's not going to be the, the same in the future. Yeah. And uh, when I, I hear you talking about this with so, so much sophistication, that you can't, you can't treat this as a simple topic. And uh, I'm reminded that when I met you, we never talked about climate, we talked about chasing tornadoes. That's right, yeah. So I, do you feel like you've undergone an education and a change over the years to write books like this? Oh, I absolutely have. Yeah, yeah. When I was in graduate school at meteorology yeah. at the University of Oklahoma in the 1980s, uh, I had very little interest in climate as, as a subject per se. I was, I was all about weather, severe weather. I got interested in growing up in Oklahoma. Um, it was really after coming to Boulder, and especially after starting uh, to work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in 1989, that this rose in my consciousness, because that was just after the Yellowstone fires in 1988, uh, Jim Hansen's testimony on Congress, that in fact we were starting to see the signal rising above the noise. And that's when climate change really burst into the headlines, in the summer of 88. So I started less than a year after that. All of a sudden I was able to interview some of the world's top climate scientists, and I really got in a quick education, and an extensive one over the years. And that's been hand in hand with the rising global temperature really accelerating in the 80s and 90s. So yeah, it's been a process, and um, I know many scientists and other folks who have gone through evolutions of their own. Uh, Tom Carl, the head of the National Climate Data Center, uh, was fairly skeptical about anthropogenic climate change. Uh, when he uh, was looking at it in the early 90s. He's talked about his own kind of uh, uh, evolution so it's been quite a process, and um, I think having interest in, in weather from the beginning has helped me kind of keep my feet on the ground on the topic to some extent. Um, I think it's always helpful for a, a climate person to know enough weather to be able to blend it. And likewise, for every meteorologist to know about climate so they understand how the two fit together. Because I really think it's that intersection between weather and climate that is a critical one. Um, every climate change we see is going to be experienced on some level as weather, right? Mm -hmm. We don't wake up and say, boy, what a beautiful climate today. <laughs> it's always going to be weather. Uh, it's just climate change cha changes the odds of certain kinds of weather. And um, that's what we're going to have to be dealing with and adjusting to. Do you feel like it's changed the way you look at weather, basically, in that sense? Yeah, you know, as someone who's always loved extreme weather, I, I, I have a funny ambivalence when, when we have record highs, uh, such as uh, late May in, in Beijing, uh, it's near 100 degrees, or perhaps over 100, and uh, that was the hottest day ever been in May. And a little part of me finds that exciting, and another part of me finds that really ominous. And so I'm having to kind of tamp back my natural excitement about extremes. But that is compelling to me, and it also keeps me interested in the subject. You know? uh, whenever our, our natural environment is doing something that we don't expect or that's out of the realm, it's, it's very fascinating to me. Um, I think also as a kid, I realized that disasters can pull people together in a way. Uh, you know, if a, a massive tornado or hurricane, it brings out the best of people in a lot of ways. And, uh, 
you know, maybe climate change can do that on an even broader scale, on an even longer term. You know, if we can figure out how to deal with climate change on I mean, it's, it's multiple manifestations, multiple levels, we can probably solve almost any global problem. It's, just, it's, it's hard to think of one, you know, more intangible in some ways, you know, the cause is invisible. There's so many aspects that just make it a tough problem to deal with. So, uh, you know, chip around the edges and then slowly work on the big pieces. You know, we need the whole world on board. You know, sometimes that involves leadership. It can be model, be the model. Sometimes it involves diplomacy. Um, all this is beyond what one person can do. But we're all citizens. We're all national and global citizens. So we all have a stake in this. Well, it seems to me that this is not one piece you'd want to chip around the edges. <laughs> But you want to dig in and get started on reading the Thinking Person's Guide to Climate Change. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for sharing.